talk about the guide I created for young adults who are diagnosed with acute lymphoblastic leukemia. So I want to start off with just some background information on acute lymphoblastic leukemia, or ALL for short. It's a type of blood cancer involving the malformation of white blood cells as they're developing and maturing in the bone marrow. It's called acute because the symptoms are usually onset in the first couple of weeks or months after you get this. Um, it's not really like months or years like chronic diseases. And there's also no known risk factors beyond oncogenetic mutations. So things like smoking or laying out in the sun aren't really going to increase your chances of getting this disease. It's really just those oncogenetic mutations that you, there's just a very low chance of having those develop. And also it's most commonly seen in children. Um, it's considered a childhood disease, but adults are able to get this. It's not uncommon, but it's mainly in children. And so there's two main treatments that exist right now, the adult treatment that they use, and then also the pediatric protocol they use for younger children. So here's a graph of the patient demographics, like I said. It's mostly in children. Um, also, young adults have a higher chance of getting it, and it kind of tapers off with age. Um, most cases are children. The research and studies, it's kind of not proportional to what you would think. A lot of the studies being done are on the adult cases, not the children or young adults themselves. And so there's better reports and out, out there for the adults getting this, so the treatments are kind of more understood, better studied. But we kind of need that to shift towards the young adult and child population. So some problems faced by young adults who are diagnosed with ALL, there's not really a set chemotherapy regimen for them. It's really up to their doctor's discretion. We kind of let the doses, the timing of the doses, stuff like that. It's really on a case-by-case -case protocol right now. Um, yeah, they're making a lot of judgment calls about that, so it's kind of just in, like a gray area for the doctors. And also because of these complications, young adults face an 8% increased chance of recurrence of the disease as opposed to children. Um, like I said earlier, they're also underrepresented in the medical research. There's just less studies and inconsistent studies just because this population, there's a lot more variables. Um, they're younger, they might be moving around the country for jobs, personal life, etc. So they're just harder to kind of like keep a track on. So they're changing doctors, like the, their records might not be like shared from doctor to doctor. If they move, they might not keep up with that like themselves because they're an adult now. It's their responsibility to, to pass that information on to new doctors. And also just a lack of adherence to protocol. This is kind of just a maturity thing. They think, okay, I'm in remission. I don't need to follow. I don't need to keep taking these pills every day, but they really do. It's a long, drawn-out um, treatment process to make sure you stay in remission, and sometimes they're just not responsible enough to handle that for themselves. So what can be done to change this? Um, we can unify research being conducted. So at research hospitals, we just need to encourage oncologists to be communicating with one another across the country, across the world, really just making sure that they're reporting like what's successful for them and their specific patients they're seeing and sharing that as much as possible so other doctors can take that into account when they're treating patients if there's someone similar like somewhere else in the world. Also define incremental age brackets like the graph earlier it's really like 20 and younger than like in your 30s and your 40s we need more specific age brackets than that because someone who's 18 might be a lot more different than someone who's like 22 or 25 but they're kind of being treated on the same protocol which isn't showing very successful rates right now. Um, also, we can just empower individual patients themselves with this current information, just kind of getting the new publications out there that are really only being seen by these doctors and researchers, and we need to put that in the hands of the patients so they can have more, um, more meaningful dialogues with their doctors so they're actually being a part of their treatment. And also, just having this information can just help them navigate those tough months of treatment. They'll just understand the disease process more. They'll under, understand the um, chemotherapy drugs that they're receiving, so it just kind of helps them internalize this and just kind of make it their own. And so throughout this semester, what I've created is a PDF guide, and I also published it as a website. And it's targeted at the young adults themselves. It's not at, for older, older adults, or it's not for like the caregivers of children. It's targeted toward, towards these like maybe 20-something-year-olds who are going through this treatment themselves. It's written in second person, unlike most publications that are just kind of like just generic, like a Wikipedia article kind of. And so it's kind of more en engaging for them to read. It's kind of interesting. It's, it seems more like a dialogue than just spewing facts at them. And it's also easily accessible and shareable online. So the millennial generation, we're all on smartphones or laptops all the time. So for inpatients in a hospital setting, they're going to have their phone nearby. They're going to have a laptop on their little table. So they can just pull up this guide whenever they want. They can reference it whenever they want. And also, it is a PDF. And so it is printable if they do want that hard copy or if someone wants to share it or doctors want to give it out to their patients. And so how I went about creating this guide, I did an intense literature review, as I have here. I went through and just found pretty much any publication to do with leukemia and adults, pediatrics, young adults, anything I could find, I really just scored the um, medical journals for. Um, I also interviewed with medical professionals. 
so doctors, nurses, stuff like that. Also, I talked with patients and their caregivers themselves, seeing what tips or advice that they just had themselves at, th at going through chemotherapy. Then. And then also just my own personal experience I put into this guide. So first, with that extensive literature review, I really want to do a comparative analysis between the adult protocols and the pediatric protocols. And so the overarching theme that I found through this was the pediatrics, they can actually withstand more intense and um, frequent treatments than the adults. I guess they're just your, their younger bodies can bounce back from these treatments faster, and therefore they can withstand more harsh treatments than the adults, which gives them a better chance of survival. And so for young adults, what they're doing right now is kind of trying to figure out the best hybrid techniques to use between the adult and pediatric protocols. So they're, it's kind of just like a mixing matching of what they can withstand, what they can't withstand compared to the children and just seeing what they can give them to give them the best chance of um, remission and survival rates for the long term. And so also with this, I just looked into what, com what complications doctors have to consider when they're treating these patients. So one thing that's kind of common with ALL is the presence of lymphoid tumors. So they kind of have to treat around that or what they can give, what's gonna be more effective against that because they kind of have to get, get that under control before they can treat the leukemia also. And, and then just general pre-existing health conditions that anyone could be, like anyone could have going into this. So like diabetes, heart conditions, even drug allergies is a big one. So if you're allergic to a certain chemotherapy drug, you're not gonna be able to receive that during your treatment. So they might have to shift what else they're giving you. <coughs> and then that can just kind of twist a whole <coughs> chemotherapy regimen around. So they have to figure out a whole new plan of action for you. And then I went on and interviewed with medical experts. So I talked with oncologists. The big, I kind of wanted to know what they're referencing as a doctor in the field. So the big thing that I learned was uptodate.com, as the name tells you. It gives you a lot of updated, um, recent medical advice for any kind of disease, really. And so that's kind of like their go-to guide. If they're, if they're treating something that they don't encounter on a day-to-day -day basis, they'll go to this site and kind of just figure out what they need to do to treat their patients. But it's really good information, but how specialized can it be? It's kind of just a general database. So if you have a patient with a lot of complications or have a tricky disease process that's not really following the main protocol, they kind of have to go off on their own somewhere else and find out new information to kind of treat these new problems. I also talked with oncology nurses. They kind of have more general day-to-day -day tips because they're seeing these patients in the hospital day in, day out, nighttime. That's usually when you, have, you go through your roughest um, side effects of the drug, so they kind of have a lot more like general information about just treating and caring for chemo patients. I also talked with dietitians, the healthy meal options they have to offer chemo patients, it differs a little bit. And then also just tricks for maintaining weight, especially in the young adult population. I mean, your body image is something a lot of people are self-conscious about, and if you're going through chemotherapy, you might be losing weight, you kind of look more sickly, and you can kind of be self-conscious about that, so just any tricks for curbing that could be really helpful. And then I also talked with physical therapists, just exercises that inpatients can do in their beds and their chairs just around the hospital, just maintaining that energy. And also as an outpatient, like what else you can do to just make sure you're staying as healthy and active as possible going through treatment. And so I also held discussions with cancer patients and their caregivers and just whatever advice they wanted to add into the guide themselves, I kind of took into account and tried to put in there as well. And then also my own personal life experience I added to this guide. I myself was diagnosed with ALL in December of 2015. I received treatment at UVA Medical Center currently. And I was in, I've been in remission since July of 2016, so I've kind of been through this myself. And I've been on maintenance chemotherapy, or I will be on it until November 2018, so this is a long process. That's why this guide is necessary. You're gonna be going through treatment for years, and you aren't considered cured until five years after your remission date, so it's a long process. So a guide to help people cope with this is definitely necessary. So the topics in my guide that I kind of cover, the big ones in the guide are the chemotherapy phases you'll see and the common drugs used, nausea management, exercise and fatigue management, nutrition and hydration, and then the psychological and social well-being of the patient I also address. So I just kind of want to click this link here to take us to my website. So this is the home page, you kind of have just a, a, broad, a broad overview of like what the guide entails, a summary of contents for them if they don't feel like going through themselves and reading everything, and then just a little note about me and telling them who I am and why I wrote this kind of. And so these are the sections I'll cover in the slides, but I just kind of want to show you, that here's the link if they want to download the guide as a PDF, they can just click this and download it. And so they can just print it out that way. Let me go back. This. Okay, yeah, so they can just access that really easily online so that doctors can share the link to anyone really. And so the first um, section of the guide is the chemotherapy phases and drug use. So I kind of go through the main phases of like the broad overall treatment they'll be getting. So the first phase is induction. It's the first four to six weeks where they just try and hit you with a lot of 
different chemotherapy drugs with kind of like high doses to try and induce remission by killing as many cancerous cells as possible in that first month or so. And then it goes into the consolidation and intensification phase, which is about eight to 12 weeks, depending on your regimen. And in, th in that phase, they're trying to retrain your bone marrow to only produce healthy white blood cells, so you're not producing any more cancerous cells. And then after that, you're into maintenance, where they're just making sure you're staying healthy. You're on a low dose. So you're going in for basically like monthly checkups, just making sure you're staying healthy. And just kind of, they're kind of keeping you a little <coughs> bit suppressed, just so you only the healthiest white blood cells are being produced at that time. And so also in this guide, um, I just go over a lot of the drugs used, so here's a chart that's included in the guide. Um, I go into more detail in the guide about each and every drug used, and then I just kind of give a big, broad overview of them if you just want a quick reference, really. And I also just talk about stuff that's important for young adults to consider during going through chemotherapy as opposed to adults or children. Um, so one big thing is this one drug called a pegylated asparaginase. It's a really strong drug. They use it in pediatric protocols because they can withstand these drugs a little bit better than adults, but it it has been shown that it's very effective at killing cancerous cells, so if adults can withstand the treatment of it, it is very like helpful and it has shown very high success rates. So this is something that young adults might want to talk with their doctor about, the possibility of incorporating this drug into their regimen. I mean, they might not want to, they might be hesitant at first because there's a lot of risk factors like blood clots, um, strokes, seizures, and stuff like that, so it's really, um, it's dangerous, but if used effectively, it's really helpful. Um, so the next, um, the next part of this guide is the nausea management section. So I kind of go over the nausea medications out there. So if, they're, if they have like a high amount of nausea, they can, might change, they might want to change their drugs. And so if they go into a, a conversation with their doctor, they can go in educated about the different types of drugs out there. I give them a broad overview of each kind of different type of drug that can cure nausea. And also I include home remedies that the people gave me, the nurses, the other chemo patients out there. Um, a big thing is ginger, ginger teas, ginger candies, like lozenges, cookies. A lot of people are just out there saying ginger is the way to go if you want to um, curb your nausea with like a home remedy. Also just the trick of using like smaller frequent drinks or meals. You don't want to sit down and eat like a giant Chipotle burrito. That's going to really spike some nausea. So you kind of want to like snack throughout the day, take sips of water. Don't just like chug a full glass of water because you're like probably going to throw it up if you're really feeling bad that day. And also just increasing physical activity it has been shown like everyone says that you need to get out and walk and move around. It kind of just helps suppress the nausea, just like getting your blood flowing and stuff like that. And so that kind of leads into the next section, the exercise and fatigue management. Um, I talked with a physical therapist, physical therapist assistant, they ch um, told me a bunch of exercises for inpatients and outpatients, so in the guide I include just a bunch of YouTube clips of like how to go about doing those exercises because most general people don't, aren't like sports medicine experts, they don't know all these different little exercises for different muscle groups, so I kind of just show them little short little guides with YouTube clips. And so also, as an outpatient, once you're like released from the hospital, you kind of want to find activities with social aspects. So, because it's been shown that you'll be more prone to going back and doing them over and over again if you have, if there is a social aspect, if there is a reason to go back and do those activities. And then also in this section, I just go I, over some tips for planning events with friends. As a young adult, you want to go out, you want to see friends, but you're also fighting cancer. You're going through chemotherapy, so you're going to be tired. You're going to be fatigued. So. Things you can do is talk with your doctor about scheduling appointments. If you know there's like a big party, a big wedding coming up, you might want to delay possibly your treatment like a few days or maybe a week so you can get to that event, feel your best, and then receive your treatment right afterwards. That is something possible if you talk with your doctor. Um, also, power naps, that was a big one for me. If you know people are coming over, you might want to sleep in that day or maybe a lot of time after they come over. If they leave, kind of crash for a little bit, rejuvenate yourself, just make sure you're taking care of yourself even though you do want to maintain that social aspect of your life. Also, I touch on nutrition and hydration. Everyone knows nutrition and hydration is important just in general life, but um, I kind of just go into the reasons why it is even more so important for chemo patients. So increased energy levels, you want to make sure you're getting a lot of protein in your diet. That'll help maintain the production of red blood cells. It'll promote energy and also just muscle mass. You need to maintain that. And then just improves the metabolism of drugs. So if you're eating regularly, you'll be passing those drugs regularly so they're not staying in your system too long and doing unnecessary damage to your organs. Um, the importance of eating safe foods while you're going through chemotherapy, you're going to be immunocompromised. You're going to have a low white blood cell count, so you're not going to be able to fight off infections in general. And so one is foodborne infections. And so things like buffets or undercooked meats are like a really high risk for chemo patients, especially leukemia patients. So you kind of want to avoid that. Just try and stay home, have home cooked meals that you know are well done, that are safely prepared and stuff like that. And then finally, the role of hydration. So 
doctors, physical therapists, everyone just says chug water, you stay hydrated, it's gonna make you feel better, it's gonna give you more energy, and it also just helps reduce the strain on your kidneys and livers, because after this, after you go through all this treatment, you wanna come out as healthy as possible to live your life as long as possible, so you don't wanna do unnecessary damage to your kidneys and livers when you're processing these really harsh drugs and chemicals, so by flushing your system, you're really preventing that. And then finally, the last part of the guide just touches on the psychological and social well-being of the patient. So I provide resources for healthy coping mechanisms. I'm not a psychiatrist or anything myself, so I kind of just want to point them in the right direction for like online resources or things in the hospital, their own hospital that they can go to, people they can reach out for, for help. And then also just communication techniques to maintain relationships with your friends and family. This is a long, drawn-out treatment process, so you're going to need that support system in your life. And so one thing is the chemo-induced irritability. There's some drugs that actually like chemically change your brain, so you're gonna be grumpy and you don't know why, but you kind of like have to get through that and you kind of, you have to explain to the people around you that that's gonna be happening because they might feel shut out, you might just be like in your room all day, but they don't know why or no, they don't know how to help. So just communicating like how you feel, why you feel that way, let them know it is like kind of the drugs talking right now, it's not like you hating them. This kind of like helps <laughs> keep those relationships like healthy. <laughs> And then also just finding your new normal, like your life kind of gets flipped upside down with a diagnosis like, like this. So you kind of need to redefine like what your life is. You need to find new activities, new hobbies you do that you can enjoy um, that are still safe while you're going through this treatment. You need to find things that kind of get your mind off of your diagnosis, off of your treatment, kind of just help you forget about all these stresses and just kind of move on with your life throughout these years and just kind of get through it the best you can really. And so the hopes for the future, I hope that this guide gives the advice to the young adults diagnosed with ALL that I would have wanted to receive in those first couple of days in the hospital. Um, if I can help one person out there, all of this work was really more than worth it. <laughs> um, I'd also like to promote and improve communication in the cancer community. So this would be researchers, doctors and nurses, patients and caregivers, like everyone in the cancer community can really just like help. Can also, you can really benefit from improved communication from everyone so that, like the patients are receiving the best care and best treatment options possible. And also in the future, I'd like to see an increase in those age brackets. So personalizing the chemo treatments based on age, so kind of redefining and making it more specified the age bracket <coughs> the system that they're using, not just pediatrics and adults. So everyone is receiving just more personalized treatment because that has been shown to show the best survival rates, really. So here's kind of the graph. This is the model we saw earlier in the presentation. So they kind of just have everyone grouped like 20 and under here, and then it kind of goes off into like older age brackets. What I would like to see is kind of it really divided up at the beginning of because a, two, a, a toddler is not the same as a 9 to 12 year old, like a 13 year old is not the same as a 17 or 18 year old. We really need to redefine these brackets, like in this age demographic especially, just to make sure people are receiving the treatment that they need. And so I'd like to acknowledge some people. So first off, my advisor, Dr. Stockwell, for helping me write this guide and just really keeping me on track and just making this guide the best I could make it as possible. My oncologist, Dr. DeVos at UVA, he's been great. He actually kind of helped co-suggest this project for me. With, he wanted me to look into fatigue management because I was kind of lazy during my treatment and was really tired all the time, so he wanted me to look into exercising. <laughs> and so that kind of spurred this project from that. And then also just the cancer patients and caregivers that took the time to talk with me throughout this and just giving me the advice and sharing their own stories with me. And my family and friends for really getting me through the past year and a half. They've really been a huge <laughs> support for me. So with that, I'll open it up to questions. Um, what hospital did you interview people at? Um, mainly UVA, because I was there for treatment. I went to the cancer center across the street there, so I met a lot of people. And then also in my hometown, just people I know, like fr family, friends, and stuff that were diagnosed with different cancers just throughout the years. So I just caught up with them and <laughs> talked, really. <laughs> Um, my favorite part, I guess, I, I hated starting writing a section, like I always like had like writer's block really bad, but like once I kind of got my thoughts collected and got it down on the page and like revised it a couple times and when I went back and reread it, I'm like, wow, this is actually powerful, it's impactful, it might actually help someone, like looking back on it and seeing that it actually does like have that potential to help people is really rewarding. Yeah. Do you know why the standard is like five years to be considered cured after your remission date? Um, that's just the general rule of thumb for leukemia because I guess like other cancers that are like more like solid masses, they can like remove them, but it's really like with leukemia, it's coming from the blood cells being produced in your bone marrow, so they can't like invasively do a surgery and like test that all the time. So 
it's really just like if it's been five years since you've produced leukemic cells, they kind of just say you're pretty much cured. They're like you're back down to the chance of reproducing those cells as like a normal healthy person it's just through tests and <laughs> studies. Yes. Did you encounter resources for the few unfortunate folks who aren't doing well? Um, I guess <laughs> I was more focusing on just like getting through and like yeah. the. But I mean, there are resources out there. A lot of the um, things I saw were like the chaplaincy programs at hospitals, I guess, would be like like those resources out there that you would talk to, like someone like that who had, is like trained to talk with people in like terminal <coughs> situations. Um, not yet. I guess I'm hoping to collaborate with UVA first, and I guess I could talk with um, the cancer center that I also went to a couple times in the, my Fredericksburg area, my hometown. So I'm really like, like just finished it like just now, so I'm like kind of now going to branch out and <laughs> kind of like give it out as a resource. Yes. Uh, you mentioned a drug that worked better for uh, young adults rather than like actual adults. Mm -hmm. How? Why? I was just wondering. Um, it's just a really powerful drug. So it actually works best in like pediatrics, so like younger kids. And now they're trying to, they're starting to use it in like younger adults. So it's just, it, it's just like the trend in the chemotherapy. Like the younger kids bounce back. Their like cells are, their cells are just being, they're growing faster. So when you're like killing off those cancer cells, you're also killing healthy cells. But younger kids are just growing, so they're regrowing those healthy cells faster than an older adult who is kind of like slowed down in that sense so when you're killing all those cancerous cells you're also killing healthy cells and so it just takes them longer to like recover from that whole treatment so now they're trying to like work out the best dosing that can work for young adults and like health like healthier slightly older adults and give them this drug and see like just how much they can possibly give them because it will help them kill the cancer cells but it's just like that rebounding is just slower for the older you get <laughs> Great, thank, thank you. you. <laughs>